Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all this morning. You're probably wondering who in the world I am. Um, I've met maybe many of you, uh, a good bit of you, uh, in the past, but my name is Ben Elaine, and I am uh, actually in town this weekend uh, celebrating Thanksgiving with uh, Danielle and Drew McGee, my in-laws. And uh, yeah, we got a fan, okay. Uh, my, my wife Ashley over here and our daughter Audrey, we were, uh, we were able to bring her as well, so um, if you want to say hey to her, feel free to drop by. She may amen me a little bit throughout the sermon, so disregard that. Uh, but I'm, I'm so glad to be with you guys. Uh, Scott was out of town, and with me coming into town, um, I've had the privilege of worshiping with you all many times before, and uh, I'm, I'm just honored uh, to be able to open God's Word with you this morning and uh, see what he has to say for us. So uh, our, our sermon is going to be on this theme of hope, as you guys have seen the Advent candle lit today. And, and I want us to look at, at hope from the beginning. And so you, it may seem strange for us to jump all the way back into Genesis, uh, but I want us to see something that is really fundamental uh, to, to all of the Bible, to all of uh, kind of the, the scope of redemption of, of what God has been doing and how there's, there's really always been hope that, that's been held out uh, to us as humanity. And so we'll look at that today in Genesis chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to take those out and flip open to Genesis 3. Shouldn't take too many pages to get there. We'll do our best this morning. I'm, I'm sure many of you are still in somewhat of a tryptophan haze. Um, yes, I can get some amens to that. I know I am as well. I've been slow moving this morning, and so we'll pray that the Lord will, uh, will still open, open our eyes um, and our minds to be receptive. So uh, Genesis chapter 3, I'm just going to read verses 8 through 19 for us this morning, and then we'll pray. <clears throat> It says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Let's pray. Father God, we are thankful, Lord, for the opportunity this morning to, to open your word, God, and from it, Lord, to hear this direct revelation to us, God, that you have not left us without a, a witness to who you are, to your character, to how you're working in the world, how you're sowing salvation, even as we speak now, Lord. And so we ask God for receptive hearts this morning, God, that we would humble ourselves uh, under your word, be receptive to it, God, open to being rebuked where that's necessary, God. Open to being challenged where that's necessary, Lord. And we thank you for this, this good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord, that though we were without hope, hope has been held out to us at the cross and in the resurrection. Lord, human sinfulness dealt with fully and finally and us given this opportunity at, at new life, this opportunity to be united to Jesus Christ now and for all of eternity, Lord. And so would we 
savor this truth, God, this morning, even as we look at Genesis chapter 3. God, would you truly plant this, this seed of hope into our hearts, God, and would it speak into even the situations uh, that we come into this room with today, Lord, situations which may feel hopeless, and yet, God, you are at every turn showing us that there is hope, um, God. And so we, we have confidence in your word, Lord, uh, confidence in, in what you have done for us in the gospel, Lord. And so would we anchor our lives to that and, and focus on that even this morning as we open your word and pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, one of, one of the best depictions of, of an idyllic place in, in all of literature is the Shire in Lord of the Rings. Any of you familiar with this book trilogy? Maybe you've seen the movies, you're not much of a reader. But there's this idyllic place that's held out to the reader, that's held out to the viewer if you're watching this movie. And in the Shire, it's this, it's this place where, where tables are always full of food, and this place where friends are always close by, and there's always something warm to drink, and there's a fire that's burning off to the side. It's this place where, where the characters in these books in Lord of the Rings, they, they find comfort, and they find rest, and they find peace. It's this anchor they can always go back to, no matter where they find it themselves. And the, the author of the Lord of the Rings, Tolkien, he does this great job in his books of portraying this place where rest can be found, of portraying this place where, where all is right with the world. And he, and he also does a great job of portraying this longing for that place, this longing for home that, that we really all feel and experience in our day-to-day lives, this, this longing for home, this longing for this place of rest. And when we read those books, we, we see in this story that, that Frodo, this person who lives in the Shire, he has to set out on this journey to destroy the, the one ring to rule them all, as the story tells us. And he has to go to some scary places along the way, and he finds himself eventually at Mount Doom itself, where he's going to destroy the ring. And throughout the course of this journey that, that Frodo is on, he's continually encountering all sorts of troubles without and within. He's coming across evil in a way that he's never seen. He's recognizing in, in his own heart this, this evil that's, that's kind of right there under the surface, this desire for power, even as he has the ring himself. And, and one of the things that, that really kind of breaks your heart is that throughout the story, it leads him to kind of this realization that he can't really ever go back to the Shire, that he can't really ever go back to this place as it once was, this idyllic place. Though, though it may remain the same, he knows that he has been changed in fundamental ways. And therefore, going back is never really an option. And towards the end of the third book, there's even this quote, uh, which just comes across as so heartbreaking to me. And he's reflecting on wanting to go home, and he, and he says this. He says, there is no real going back. Though I may come to the Shire, it will not seem the same, for I shall not be the same. I am wounded with knife, with sting and tooth, and a long burden. Where shall I find rest? You see, we, we too encounter many things that make us realize that the way back home is treacherous and will never be reached apart from some help outside of ourselves. That this way back home, when we look at the Genesis story, when we look in chapters 1 and 2, we see this picture of, of shalom. We see this picture of the way that things were supposed to be. And so uh, what we realize from that is that the world as we see it and as we experience it so often in our daily lives is not as it should be. That there is much wrong, that we encounter many trouble without, troubles without and troubles within. And this isn't just something that we kind of see with our eyes, but it's something that we really feel in our gut. We feel this on a, on a deep, deep level. This pronounced sense that the way things play out in the world around us is not always the way that they should play out. And this isn't tied to, to maybe a, a political vision that we might have um, or, or some ideal era that we want to go back to, but it's something deeper than that. It's something that, that we see, that we sense kind of in, in the fabric of the universe itself, that there's something not right 
that, that justice isn't always served, that there's not always peace. We see war, we see strife, we see unfairness. And what we don't see is this wholeness and this fullness of, of the way things used to be, of the shire, of, of this, this way that things were in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And so we, we, a couple of kind of tangible ways we sense this in, in nearly every corner of our lives, nearly every day of our lives. We think of human relationships, which are so often, uh, while, while they can bring us great joy and satisfaction, they're so often also filled with, with pain and, and estrangement and even strife. And when we think about our work that we put our hands to, we can so often feel as if we're just engaging in some sort of futile effort, that, that our work is even, it's, it at times can feel meaningless to us. We find that, that we fall into sin patterns time after time, that though we go to the Lord and, and confess that to him, we still struggle with it in our day-to-day lives. We find ourselves like Paul in Romans 7 saying, I don't do the things that I want to do, but I do the things that I don't. Broken and flawed. And maybe even relevant to your, your past few days, the holidays are a difficult time as well where we see this kind of disconnect with how things should be and how they often are. We see uh, arguments with family members breaking out over Thanksgiving dinner, this time when we're supposed to be coming together, really being a catalyst for driving us apart and for sowing division. And maybe less seriously, we see this, this way in which things are not as they should be in, in even the cooking of the meal on Thanksgiving, right? How many of you burned your turkey on Thursday morning or came incredibly close to burning your turkey? Or how many of you ended up with a turkey that was dry, um, and, and which is the cardinal sin of Thanksgiving, that you would have a turkey that was dry, a sign of the fall right before your very eyes. I will say that Drew knows how to cook a turkey, so ours was not. I want to give some praise where it is due. And so what we see in, in all of this, in these big ways and even in these small ways, is that something has gone wrong with the world. It's not always as it should be. It doesn't mean that there's not still good and there's not still beauty in this world, uh, but we have this, this sense that, that it is not as full as it should be, that it is not as it once was before Genesis 3. And so this sin has entered the world. Brokenness is now on full display. We see creation itself kind of tearing at the seams oftentimes, and we see our own hearts as filled with sinful desires. And the story of the Bible is, is in so many ways a, a kind of tracing out of how things have gone wrong, which we see here in Genesis 3 today. And then also uh, how things might be put right again, right? We don't want to be all doom and gloom this morning. I, I want us to see that there is hope uh, and that there has been hope from the beginning even. And so we see the story, it begins to take shape here in, in Genesis chapter 3. But to even understand fully kind of the tragedy of Genesis chapter 3, to feel the full weight of that, we have to understand the world as it was before the fall in its fullness, the way that it was uh, when, when Adam walked in the garden uh, with the Lord. And I think no single word captures the situation before the fall better than this word that I've already used, which is this word shalom. Maybe you've heard this word before. It's this Hebrew word of shalom, and it can be translated as peace. Uh, but but it's, it's almost more than peace, maybe as we understand it today. We, we understand peace so often just in the absence of strife or in the absence of having any sort of enemy that's, that's causing us harm or danger. It's this fuller vision, though, of peace. It's this perfect peace. It's, it's the presence of all that is good. It's this picture of wholeness, of completeness. This picture of, of justice actually reigning and having the day. This picture of all things being in their right place. And one author, he describes it as this. He says, on Shalom, he says, We call it peace. But it means far more than mere peace of mind or a ceasefire between enemies. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, and delight. Shalom, in other words, is the way things ought to be, he says. And so part of this shalom, too, is, is something that's, that really resonates with us and even goes back to some of the difficulties that we may have experienced over this past week, which is, that in this presence of shalom, this perfect peace, there's also this unbroken fellowship with God and with other people. And so it's, it's a, a perfect peace. It's this sense of wholeness, 
of completeness, of things in their right place. And this is the picture we have in Genesis 1 and 2. As God creates, as he uh, commissions Adam to be this sort of caretaker of this creation, and, and what we really start to see is that in every sense, in, in, in these large ways and these small ways, shalom is the way that things ought to be. And so here's a picture of what this might even look like today. Um, if we were to actually experience this uh, kind of on a day-to-day basis, um, this author Cornelius Plantinga in his book, Not the Way It's Supposed to Be, he writes this about shalom. He says, it would include, for instance, strong marriages and secure children, Nations and races in this brave new world would treasure differences in other nations and races as attractive, important, complementary. Government officials would still take office, but to nobody's surprise, they would tell the truth and freely praise the virtues of other public officials. This is all around the world. People would stimulate and encourage one another's virtues. Just newspapers would be filled with well-written accounts of acts of great moral beauty, and at the end of the day, people on their porches would read these, and they would savor them, and they would call to each other about them. And he says, above all, in the vision of the Christian, God would preside in the unspeakable beauty for which human beings long, and in the mystery of holiness that draws human worship like a magnet. This picture of shalom that God residing in beauty is is the one who we would worship and we would do so perfectly. This is the type of world that I think we ache for, that we long for, and that we hope for. We, We ache for, we long for the world as it was before the fall, before human sinfulness came on the scene and made a mess of things. We, like Frodo, we want to go back to this. We want to go back to the Shire where we can find rest. And so the, when we take a look a little bit closer at Genesis uh, 1 and 2, we see shalom being enjoyed in a couple of ways that I want us to, to draw out. We see, we see first this perfect peace, as we've talked about, that there's no presence of strife, no presence of anxiety. We see that God's presence is being fully experienced, that it's being fully enjoyed, right? It, Adam is talked about as one who's walking with God in the cool of the day, that he's enjoying the presence of God, unbroken fellowship. We see that God's creation is being enjoyed in its fullness, that even the good gifts that God has given to Adam in, in providing livestock and providing this beautiful garden to reside in, he, he's enjoying these things in a fuller way than we are even able to enjoy them today because sin has not yet tainted the picture, tinged it all with this sort of sense of being broken. And, and really, I think the, the kind of the pinnacle of what we see and, and what happens before the fall and what we're often having this longing for is this unbroken fellowship with God and with others. Like we, we resonate with that so deeply. We so deeply want to be united to God without anything being in the way of that, without our sin getting in the way of that, without it keeping us from seeing God as, as worthy of our worship. We so desire for that unbroken fellowship with God to work itself out into our own lives so that we would be able to relate to one another better, so that we would be able to love one another more fully and so this, this shalom that is enjoyed, this perfect peace, this wholeness, this completeness in Genesis 1 through 2 is what has been lost in the fall. Like, I, I want us to see how the full weight of what really takes place in 8 through 19 in Genesis 3, we lose all of that as sin enters into the picture. And so look there, in, in verses 8 through 10, right off the bat, we see shalom being disrupted in this way. We see broken fellowship, kind of that, that pinnacle of what was enjoyed as a part of shalom before the fall, this broken fellowship with God. We see it in 8 through 10 of our passage today because we go from this picture of of Adam walking with God in the garden to this picture of Adam and Eve now hiding from God. They're hiding from his presence. They go from enjoying his presence to fearing his presence. They know that they've transgressed this one kind of rule that God has set up in, in not eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and because they have crossed that line, they know that there are consequences. That this, this God who is holy, who is just, that he, he is going to have to punish this, uh, this act of rebellion on their part. And so they fear him, and they, and they run from his presence. And, and in, in that picture, we see fellowship with God breaking down. 
In verses 11 through 13, we see another kind of broken aspect of, of the shalom that existed before the fall. We see a, a broken creation order. So when you look back in Genesis 1 through 2, you see that Adam is created. You see that he is given dominion over um, all things, over all animals, all livestock. And then we see that, that Eve is created and that the man is to serve as the head uh, for Eve, leading her well, uh, promoting her flourishing. But in 11 through 13, there's a complete reversal of this picture. And in 11 through 13, we see a broken order of creation. We see Adam blaming Eve. We see this blame shifting happen. And then Eve turns around and she blames the serpent. And so in this picture, we see a complete kind of abdication of responsibility. That that Adam is already living out of line, out of step with with the way that God would desire for him to lead. We see in in verse 16, another aspect of of shalom being disrupted, of this brokenness in in this curse that's passed down to uh, to Eve. And and in 16, we see that that she is now going to have pain in childbirth and that she's now going to have this frustration in her spousal relationship with her husband, that she's going to desire to be the head, to be the one who leads in the home, and it's going to be this constant source of frustration for her. For the man, when when his curse is passed down in verses 18 through 19, we see that he is now going to have frustration and futility in his work, that though once, uh, once the crops would grow without any obstacle, there is now going to be this difficult work that has to be done to till the land, to bring forth any sort of crop, any sort of fruit. Consequences of the fall. Shalom has been disrupted. And what's so interesting, even these curses that are passed down to to Adam and to Eve, is that in these these very things of of childbirth and of uh, kind of tilling the ground and seeing a crop come forth, there's, there's sort of shadows or fragments of hope, right? Because even in, in childbirth, though it's painful in a way that it was never intended to be, at the end of the day, there's a new child that's passed off to you. And so you go through this, this terrible thing, this, this pain in childbirth, and yet on the other side of it, there, there's this hope that you're going to have this new child to enjoy and to raise. In the case of, of raising crops, of, of tilling the ground, yes, there's going to be frustration and futility in this, but, but if, you, if you work at it, there's this fruit that's going to come from it. There's this crop that's going to be raised up. There's hope that, that that can still happen, that God is still kind of operative in the world, working to see these things come about. And so in these, these very things, we even have kind of echoes of the way that things once were and the way that they were supposed to be, and yet how they are now, that they've been affected by the fall, affected by sin. But we have here in 8 through 19, and, and what I want us to see in, in this idea of hope from the beginning, we, we have hope kind of in the wreckage of these verses. God, God does not leave us with this bleak picture for us to walk away gloomy with our heads down. But we have hope in the wreckage of the verses, and it's found in such an unlikely place. It's found in the unlikely place of the curse that's pronounced on the serpent in verse 15. The curse that's pronounced on Satan for his work of deceiving Adam and Eve. And so look there in 15. I'm going to read that again for us. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This verse right here is is really the first instance that we see of, of the good news that is to come. Verse 15, right here, we see a promise that's given to Adam and Eve through cursing the serpent of what God is going to do. And what you really see is that, that God in this moment, he's declaring war against the serpent. He's declaring war against Satan. And what he's saying is, yes, you, you've won this particular battle. You've deceived my created beings but, but what you're going to find out is that the offspring that comes from, from these very ones who, who fell, who failed to uphold uh, the, the standard that I had set, the very offspring that's going to come from them is going to be your demise. He's saying this offspring, this seed, 
It's going to come, and it says he's going to bruise your head, and you're going to bruise his heel. And he's speaking there of, of Jesus. We see this prefiguring of Jesus Christ in Genesis 3.15. We see that, that this, this good news is already coming into the world, that one day an offspring of woman is going to conquer Satan, is going to conquer this situation even that humanity finds themselves in, that we find ourselves in, that we are sinful and that we are in every way experiencing kind of the effects of the fall. And yet in, in Jesus Christ himself, this one who is coming, you are going to see a reversal of all of those things. It's this promise, it's tucked away in such an unlikely place in Genesis 3, 15. And yet it holds for us so much hope. Holds for us so much hope. And, and really this, this hope in unlikely places is a theme that persists into the Christmas story. Right? We, we see hope in unlikely places all throughout the scriptures. But I think of, of three other specific ways. We see it here in 15. We see it in the Christmas story it, when we read in, in the early parts of Luke where a manger in a backwater town in Israel is how hope enters into the world. Right, we see the, the God of the universe taking on human flesh and being born into absolute obscurity. We see this, this seed that's promised in Genesis 3.15, this offspring that's going to crush the head of the serpent. We see it, him arrive in an out-of-the-way town in a corner of a cattle stall. We see God in flesh coming to the world in humility in a way that none of us expected. Hope in an unlikely place. We see Hope in the unlikely place of the cross. We see it in the cross at Golgotha. That, that Christ the Lord, this, this reigning king, is going to assume the throne by dying in the most shameful way that one could die. That, that he's going to ascend to the throne by dying in this shameful way. And he's going to, in doing so, bring this light of salvation to those who are under a great darkness. It's hope in this unlikely place. And finally, we see, we see hope in the unlikely place of an empty and a borrowed tomb. That as Christ has, has gone to the cross, he has dealt with sin there, served as the substitute that we needed in order to have restored relationship with God. He then goes into this empty, borrowed tomb from Joseph. And the scene there is one of Christ the Lord overcoming sin and death through his resurrection that he overcomes sin and death through his resurrection, that he fully defeats the serpent whom he declared war on in Genesis 3, chapter 15. That, that he defeats this serpent, that he subverts the expectations of his disciples then, and, and he continues to ex subvert the expectations of us today in the way that he has chosen to show us how hope comes into the world. And so in all of this, I want us to see that, that there's plenty of hope to be had. That though things are, are not always as they should be, we can trust that they one day will be. We can trust that, that this shalom will be restored, that this wholeness, this completeness that was experienced before the fall will be restored. And we have hope that that can happen because of the work of Jesus Christ. And so we see that, that a weary world will rejoice when they look to Jesus Christ, when they see him in all of his shalom-restoring glory. We can see that, that weary Christians, which we might find ourselves among this number even this morning, if you're a Christian, that weary Christians can, can rejoice when they take hold of this good news of Jesus Christ in Genesis 3.15. And it's, it's even better news for us today because we know how this plays out. We know how Genesis 3.15 ends in the New Testament. And so this is, this is the hope that we have, this, this hope from the beginning. And we see that Christ has come. We see that he has shown that he is not done with his creation, that he is not done with you, that he is not done with me. We see that he has dealt with human sinfulness at the cross that he's overcome Satan, he's overcome sin, he's overcome death through the resurrection. And we see that he is up to something even now as we head towards the end of all things when shalom will be restored. And so it turns out 
that unlike Frodo, we really can go back home, can't we? That, that it, we're not going back to the Shire, but we're going back to Shalom. We have hope that this will take place. And so my charge for you this morning, church, is, is to be filled with the hope of Christ in this season. We have every reason to be. Let's pray. God, we are grateful that you have seen fit to provide us hope in unlikely places. God, that your scheme of salvation is never what we would have orchestrated. We thank you that that's the case, Lord, because you, as one who is sovereign, who is ultimately wise, God, you knew what it would take to ransom a people for yourself, to redeem this people who had fallen away from you, who had seen this fellowship with you broken. And so, God, we, we thank you that you are this one who is all wise, this one who has given us Jesus Christ, the light of the world, this one who breaks into the darkness of, of our existence, Lord, and shows us that there is hope to be had if we would only place our faith in Jesus Christ and his work on our behalf, Lord. And so I pray, God, that even this morning, Lord, that this message of hope and hope being with us from the beginning, that it would rest heavily in the best of ways upon each of us in this room, God. That for those who find themselves here who do not know Christ, God, I pray that, that, Lord, you would allow them to feel this tension in their own hearts, Lord, that they, they don't have an ultimate hope, God, because we know that that can only be found in Jesus Christ, Lord. And so would you even use your word, God, to, to open their own heart to you, to lead them to put faith in Jesus, God. I pray for those of us who, who do know you, Lord, and who know this hope, God, we know that we, we've known it in different measures throughout our lives, God, that it's so often is, is kind of this vacillating thing in our lives, Lord, that we, yes, we hope at times, but we also find ourselves uh, kind of despairing, Lord. Would you use this message this morning to remind us that we have hope in every way, Lord God, and that it's this enduring, this lasting hope that can't be taken from us. It's been given to us in Christ and no matter what we feel on a day-to-day -day basis, God, we see in the scriptures that if we have been stamped with your spirit, God, there is nothing that can take us from your grasp, Lord. And so this hope is available to us at all times, God. We love you, Lord. We thank you for Jesus Christ and all that he has accomplished for us, Lord. Increase our love for him this morning and allow us to respond rightly in worship as we go from here. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.